when when people are talking about how can they be versatile today and how can they solve the cultural problems while real estate is well real estate investing is having certain challenges today i think people ought to focus on real estate business people who retired off of their portfolios and were landlords you can do property management right Welcome yes, to the Adriana Ostafenko podcast. I'm here with Andrew. I'm not going to try to say your last name, Andrew, because I don't want to betray it. I'll let you say it. I actually heard Andrew speaking at a Crua event uh, a couple months ago now. That's the Canadian Real Estate Association, Women Association. And uh, he had such a relatable story. He also has a lot of experience in real estate and business. And I knew he was going to be just such a really great guest to have on the podcast. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm going to pass it off to you and let you introduce yourself. I'd love to hear how did you get started in real estate and where are you at now with it? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the long and the short is that I got into real estate largely because of uh, familial influence. I was fortunate, I would say, to have a positive aspect from both my parents to push me into something that would be very beneficial to me. You know, I think I almost feel like I dodged the bullet. A lot of people were told, hey, yeah, go through high school, go apply to university, go to university, get a job. And how many people do we know today that are have gotten university degrees and they're just like, I'm not even using my degree or I don't really enjoy my job. And I remember at the time my mother was looking at what I was doing. And she's like, you know, you don't really have the strongest affinity towards school. You obviously don't enjoy it too much. It's not like she didn't want me to go. My mom was a math teacher. She had a university degree from York and so did my father in physics. So it's not like they're people who don't want to encourage their kids to go into university. But they looked at me and they looked at what they were doing. My mom had just started going to Rich Dad Poor Dad seminars. My father wasn't constructed and my mom's gear started, get, started grinding. And she's just like, there's some synergy here. So they they taught me to leverage what they both had and go with that. And so with my mom being into real estate, when I had enough money working construction to buy a car, my mother essentially got me to buy a house instead, which was absolutely life changing, right? I mean, I was 18 years old, that definitely changes perspective. And I'd like to say everything after that is just history. But no, I mean, there's a lot of details in there, right? I didn't know what I was doing. Me and my brother, we essentially started picking up houses. We were house flipping. We didn't know we were house flipping. We just went in, bought a house, renovated it, and then realized that people were willing to buy it for a lot more money, right? Because this was back in 2005. So I think when people, people, people tend to look at me and then they, they don't, they don't realize how old, in, how old I am. Okay. I, that's the, at least the general impression I get. So I've been doing that since 2005. It was quite, a, it was quite a while ago, but that formula still stands true today. Because we were buying properties, flipping them, and then we would buy one to hold. And we continue that formula today because even though some people are like, well, you know, flipping is harder, buying houses is harder. It was hard then too. It's just the the level of th the level of creativity or the the formula adjusts a little bit. And what I teach people today, what I talk about is that when you are looking at getting into real estate today, everybody looks at these golden standards or formulas or the blueprint as if the blueprints don't change, right? Blueprints change, or at least they get adapted to situations, right? It's, a, it's, it's not a firm equation. There's always a variable, right? X being the variable, it will change. But the only thing that you can change though, that you can control is what you do. So when I tell people, for example, that I got into real estate with the first property at 90 something odd thousand dollars, People are just like, oh, well, that's cheating. You got in so early. What you're telling me to do is go back in time and buy a house then. <laughs> no, you just need to you just need to understand and decide, do you think things are going to get easier or harder? And if you think things are going to get harder, that's why everybody in real estate always says now is still the time because they know it's going to get harder. So the long and short of all that is that in between, I was doing house flipping and I was doing renovation jobs with my brother. Shortly after that, I ended up going through other education programs. I met my business partner, Ping. We started a property management called Spotted Properties and it manages in and around 800 tenancies. And that was very uh, interesting to do. We did that as a networking piece because yeah. I realized my networking was very, my network was very small. 
And because my network was small, I needed to get to know other real estate investors, other landlords. And I realized early on that what's the best way to get involved with other real estate investors, other landlords is to work with them and offer them something they need. Almost all landlords need property management. If they don't need it, it means they don't know they need it. So we got into that and that expanded our network. I feel like we grew it a little too far because property management is not a glorious business. It really is very humbling, <laughs> but it's necessary. It's necessary. So we did that. We grew that really far. And then we realized after we grew to our own network, where it's like we still need more people. And slowly we realized that the 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 bottleneck for us growing and scaling was our network and we weren't social media people and because we weren't social media people we didn't really understand how to take advantage of it so in the last few years we've been learning to combine our real estate with social media to take advantage of the platforms that are available to grow our network and that's what we're focusing on today because what we realize is that all the best people we work with we didn't find them they found us and we want to make sure that we continue facilitating people being able to find us. We can help them. And if we help them, then they can help us. So a lot of people that we've collaborated with through social media, finding people through social media have turned out to be great partners, I would say, in what we're doing next. So I think that covers a lot. I don't know if that covers everything, but I hope that's enough. Of <laughs> my brain is exploding with like a hundred questions and and, and mm -hmm. follow ups to everything you just said. I'm gonna circle back a little bit earlier on. This is a topic of conversation in our house, just to give you a bit of a feedback. I don't know. I don't think you know too much about me just just yet. Uh, I'm in the multifamily space in real estate. We we have about 130 units in uh, apartment buildings that we I, we own and operate. I, I own an asset management company, but I also own and co-own a couple of other businesses, including a construction business in the west end of Toronto here. And I also co-own a virtual agency that's focused on HR and help, helping small businesses scale. Okay, mm -hmm. so just a little bit of a background there. I have two kids, they're eight and 10. And we talk about, I want to kind of bring it back to the school piece, because it's a conversation we're literally just having at our house the last two days. Kids don't do great at school, to be honest, my kids don't. And it's an ongoing conversation. Part of the reason I believe is, I don't overly believe in the our like current schooling system at the end of the day, because I I don't connect with it. My daughter comes home. She's like, why do I have to learn all this stuff? And I feel the same way. I'm like, I don't think you really do. I wish you were learning other things and other skills. My husband and I are both entrepreneurs and business owners. And we know that, and I do have a master's degree myself. That's not where I'm making money. So we do know that, you know, education is not, or, or a conventional education is not necessarily your key to success. However, they need to get through a lot of years of school in the school system. So it's been an ongoing conversation. How much do we push them at school and how much do we give them opportunities to try other things and to learn different things in different ways? So wanted to get your thoughts on that. Do you have any kids? No, I'm working on it. So speak. Like, well, actually, we just got engaged. So, oh, like, congratulations! These these are the questions everybody has after you get engaged. When's the engagement party? Next thing, when's the wedding? When's the wedding? When's the Where honeymoon? Are the when are you having kids? <laughs> exactly, right? I almost want to write out a ten array with what, roughly what we have and tell people to expect reasonable delays. But jokes aside, I thought about this a lot, and I've talked to people about it because growing up, I felt like I always had to defend the fact that I didn't have a university degree. People as if though people who had university degrees were looking down on me. And I, I ended up putting a lot of thought to how to explain that. But here's the question that I conclude that I landed on is for parents, what is the value that they think comes from university? And I'll pass that question back to you in a sec. But essentially for me, because I did eventually go to universities, I did a little bit of schooling in Greece and I also did a little did university here in, in, in Ontario. I went to McMaster for nursing. But the reason or the thing that I felt I benefited most from it was the people I met in the network. The people I met in the network was the most valuable. I met my business partner there. And the honest truth was that I would have never been able to scale and grow. Me being able to grow and scale was limited by the people I knew. I knew only very ground level people, people who couldn't bridge to that higher level of thinking. And I wasn't able, there was just something I was missing and I didn't know what I didn't know. 
but the reason why I didn't go to university, my mother, my mother wrote things down because she's a math teacher. So she wrote everything down and she says, how much do you make a month? And then she multiplied that by a year. She says, if you go to university, this is how much you're not going to be making a year. And then she says, this is how much university is going to cost. This is how much accommodations are going to cost. This is how much everything is going to cost. Add that up, multiply that by four, and also assume that you're going to be a little wasting. Could you, what would you do with that money instead? And I, and at the time, that's why we decided go for real estate. And the truth is, even if you think about it today, how much do people spend on education? Like how much do you think if you had to send one of your kids to school for four years? And remember, an undergrad isn't enough today. You'd have to likely go for a master's and other things. How much do you think you're going to spend on your kids in terms of years and cost of that education just ballpark it since you probably thought about it what do you think yeah I mean just coming off of what I spent all myself because I had to pay my way through university and a master's degree I was in and around like eighty thousand dollars hundred eighty to a hundred thousand dollars yeah so if you think about it if you had to play if you had to put get your kids to do something today with a hundred thousand dollars if they got a job one they're gonna have buying capacity it might not be a lot but it's gonna be something and then you're going to have $100,000 to roll with them, what would you get them to buy? And will that probably provide them more security than the education and a job? Now, I'm not saying education is bad, right? It's just, it's just when you balance that out with how into it are they, and is it actually going to make them happy? You kind of end up asking, you, you kind of end up having to juggle something else. I don't regret going to university, but I didn't get, I think, what some people would expect I got out of it. Yeah, same here. And this is the lesson I learned. And it made me who I am. So I'm not complaining. But when you're when you have school age kids, and you know, there's just a societal pressure of like your kids need to be doing well, otherwise, you're kind of, you know, there's a pressure uh, as a parent that you looked down upon, like, what's wrong with your kid? Why are they struggling at school? Or I'm like, I don't blame them. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be like sitting there learning these things either. Why does it matter? Some of it is just so outdated or so, you know, um, I don't know. I prefer for them to be learning other things. Uh, so it's been an ongoing conversation in our house. I'm curious to see what, what comes out of that as we brainstorm some other ways to introduce our kids and to allow them to, to just to notice the things that come more naturally to them and encourage those things. And it's not always learning about facts of history and, and other things, not that it's not important. Very interesting. I'm wishing for an entrepreneurial school for kids of some sort. I'm putting it out in the universe. Somebody create that, please, and give me a call. Um, I'm writing um, on the next business idea. Awesome. Please go on ahead. Okay, so I'm going to circle back on something else that you said. You talked about your property management business, about 800 units. That's a lot of units under management. You said we grew a little too big. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so just like in any business, I'm sure you experienced this in yours, but uh, the, everything, everything always has a profitability plateau where at some point management uh, becomes too expensive. You have more people doing the work, you remove yourself from the managerial role, and then you add another layer, you have multiple managers, and these people tend to be paid a little bit more. Uh, the thing about property management in Canada is that there is no required or even good formal education for property management. No one educate you can go to you can go to schools that will give you a property management certificate. I've hired some of these people. They are some of the worst property managers I've ever come across because they are not geared towards non-standardized product. The majority of small to mid-sized landlords invest in non-standardized product. And what I mean by that is like hacked three to four or five bedroom uh, apartment buildings where they're not meant to be this way. The furnace isn't where it should be. The air pressure isn't where there should be. Thermostats aren't operating the way they ought to in so many air spaces so, uh, throughout the house. So you have now people who need to have a, a very broad and arguably complicated because how do you even get this understanding of real estate, of, of properties? Because even if you're not doing maintenance, you have to understand how to assess maintenance. And then also people and administration. So it's it's re you're really quite a versatile person for such low pay because that's the problem with it too. It doesn't pay very well. Well, it, you know, here it pays like it's property management pays something in and around 8%. So the problem being that it's not going to be uh, enough to 
maintain a high enough level capacity of a person to solve these problems at scale. So we grew too big. Now, where I do believe that property management is valuable is in the network that you create, like, like I mentioned, because what we should have done earlier at like maybe 400 units was we should have pivoted into now tendering out to our clients to JV with us into other projects. We should have done that way earlier. We should base because the problem that everybody has when they say, hey, I want to get into real estate is like, okay, well, if I have a money problem, who do I ask? Well, every landlord has money. And there's very few landlords that ever said, I'm not saying every landlord has money. Actually, every landlord might be able to pull a $40,000 line of credit. Not a lot, not enough to buy a house, but they're able to pull something. And they might want to use that money in a short term. So if you're working with somebody and you know them and you know they have this kind of money and they trust you because they've been working with you for a while, it's easier to work with them. And if somebody says, I want to get into real estate, but I don't know people with money, if you just send them an email and say, hey, I'm an investor and this is what I'm willing to do and you should invest in me, they're not going to invest in you because they don't know you from a hole in the wall. They would much rather work with somebody who they know has a proven track record of being able to maintain properties, get into real estate, deal with a variety of problems because then they have faith in you. And that's what working in real estate does. So the property management was really good for that. But in terms of the logistics, it started to plateau the minute we had to hire very high paid maintenance guys. The minute we had to hire a complex problem solvers who didn't know how to deal with tenants, because for example, a lot of problems between a landlord and tenant can be solved with a conversation. How do you hire somebody who is able to gauge that conversation? Which by the way, that is where I found nursing came in very handy to me because I was able to really, nursing taught me how to understand people. I feel a little bit better. And that, and, and, and that was a huge asset to me. And on top of that, nursing teaches you administration. And I wasn't very good at that prior. So if you, if, if you grow these things any further, you have so many areas that you have to take care of maintenance, you have to take care of evictions, rent collection, you have to take care of different, different things affecting it, like bylaw issues, if you have all these non-standardized properties, and it becomes very complicated. You find yourself constantly solving problems, and it's not worth the money. But what makes it worth the money is the people you connect with, because after a while, what we were able to densify in terms of transactions is the property management was now also taking part in real estate transactions. So we have a, a real estate team where our guys will transact properties and oftentimes rental property, it still stays with our management. So we sell it on one end from one landlord to another landlord and we're still managing it and we get the commission in between. So that is synergistic business, right? And then in terms of renovations, we have our re referred construction teams. If they do construction work, X amount of jobs in a year, they kick back some funds. And on top of that, we have our own. So that densifies it. And then if you talk about the investment part, this is where you rate really good, where we can flip houses by getting $40,000 from each person, which by the way, anybody listening to this and they're thinking, okay, are you allowed to just raise money from people? Like, can I just raise money from you? The rules are based, you're allowed to raise money from people that you have a pre-existing relationship with. Like if we're friends and we hang out and we say, hey, let's do this together. You're allowed to do that. You're, what you're not allowed to do is you're not allowed to just go broad, broadly tender out to people you don't know and say, hey, I have this investment opportunity. That you're not allowed to do. But if you're working with people already and you decide you want to do something together, you can do that. Okay. And that's where I feel like these things all come together and become so, valuable. So I understand your business model here a little bit. So you have the property management business. How many would you say roughly like percentage wise of the properties that you manage, you actually own at least part of it? Okay. So I have to count it out because it fluctuates, but let's just say, so my family, so in my family, we don't separate anything in my, in my, like my immediate family. So with my brother, my father, that type of thing, uh, we don't separate things, even cars, you know, when I buy a car, it's assumed that it's also my brother's car or something, right? We don't have that. Type of thing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of weird. Like we, 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 there's, there's not a lot of my mentality in that, even when it comes to properties, because we also put properties under family members' names as straw holders. So a straw man, Right? And that is done for a variety of reasons, capital gains, this, that, and the other, you name it. Okay, so tax purposes. So we, we our family is very meshed. So my family, we we have in we have a little so sixty three units for my family, and that ends up providing a significant base. Okay, and it's 
it becomes messy. So, and, and, that, and that's what we have there. Now through our company, we also have shares and this is where it becomes complicated to count because I know that to make numbers sound impressive, people will say, oh, I have, I have a 10% owner in all these buildings. So I own eight, 600 units, right? So because we invest with a bunch of them, I'd say that the the company probably covers another, let's just say seven or 8% of the rest of it or something like that. And I'm just guessing that's that's a question. Where it would be in around there. It's It becomes complicated to be more specific. That's fair. I understand. We have about lots of corporations, lots of shares on different things. So I get it. And different agreements on, on, on separate ones too. Just appreciate that. And then you have a real estate. So who in your company is a realtor? So then you have so, your work. Yeah. So Ping's a realtor. And Ping will bring in other realtors into the fold who are able to accommodate our clientele base. So we need we 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 were trying to recruit, which we now have done, what we call investor agents. So agents who understand how to talk numbers, what it is that real estate investors are looking for, and also who understand rental properties enough. So almost like property managers, but like who who are into the real estate, who are into the sales into the real estate transactions. So we bring in people like this and Ping's a realtor and he basically will structure the deals between our own properties and our clientele base provides enough of a base essentially for any realtors to come in and operate with us because essentially all these landlords, none of them are ever like, I don't want to buy any more rental property. They all want to buy more rental property. So it's just a matter of these realtors tapping into our network and helping them buy other property. Any landlord we have that wants to grow on the scale He's, a, he's our client and he'll want to work with us because at least our agents know what properties we can manage. And if they have a good experience managing with us, they'll want to continue that because no landlord wants to buy a property where they have to hire somebody that they don't know is going to take care of it because that's what makes a property challenging to operate. So that's what we do. And I heard construction in there. Do you also have a construction business? Not to the public. So we have, so my father always ran a construction business. He has since retired, but I retained some of the key construction, like the, the traits, some of the key traits, we maintain them. So we try to employ them full time and we'll do this through our own unit. So it's, this is where we're able to cost down considerably is we will do our own flip projects with our core crew. Anything we can't, Outs anything we can't handle, we outsource it to referred crews. And in order, but where we really make money is our own teams cost us down considerably because we pay them on a day rate, right? So, and we're able to optimize how the work is being done. So what makes renovations sometimes expensive is when you start, the question is, well, where do you stop, right? And what we're able to do in our house flipping is me or our other uh, project manager can make judgment decisions as to what is important and what is not. For example, you know, since you said you have a construction business, right? When people, people, I've noticed people don't look up and sometimes trades, especially they don't, they get really detailed to make corner, spend, they'll spend a lot of time fixing a corner and then they'll cost, they'll cost you an extra day making sure that this corner is perfectly straight. It's like, while I appreciate the workmanship, you have to understand we're not doing custom homes here. We're doing rental property. And the point here is that this needs to garner strong rents. No one's going to care if the corner is not perfectly level. It has to be level enough, right? That's just like a loose example. But this is where we, we keep our team busy. And in between flips... We bring people, we bring our teams to maintenance. So whenever we have maintenance on the property management that isn't, that is falling behind, we bring our construction team over to that. And the thing about that's nice about that is should we ever be really low on work, we can just go to one of the landlords and say, hey, you should do this at your property. We'll give this to you at a great price. And then we give it to the landlords. Now, the, the good thing about that is that we... You don't have the typical problem as a contractor or a renovator where you have to worry, am I going to get paid? Because the property management is controlling the rent flow. And so we can pay ourselves with the rent flow. So, so that's like the top, I think, in my mind, a couple of top benefits of in-house property management. One is the money comes to you. That's huge advantage. It flows through you. You always want to be that person to touch the funds first um, because you have a lot of control where to distribute it. Obviously, I know you do it out of integrity. 
you do it out of value because otherwise your business is going to go under anyway. So there is obviously an integrity that goes in there, but that gives you a lot of benefits where the funds flow through you first. Second is control of the performance of your assets. So I started my real estate portfolio in Hamilton. We grew to about 20 units, mostly four flexes. We do have property in Chatham as well. And I, it was in a house I was doing all the property management myself. Quickly realized I did not want to grow that as a business. People asked me, I said, I'm, I will only manage my own properties just because of everything you just said. It's not an easy business to be in. You're dealing with a lot of complaints, a lot of like just heavy conversations you have to have a lot of empathy, a lot of like, you're a therapist, you're a maintenance person, a you're therapist. like, <laughs> all yeah. of it involved. So I was just not I, something that not I wanted to scale, I, not something I wanted to scale on. And then we I moved into bigger apartment building space. And we've been purchasing over the last two and a half years apartment buildings. I love the scale of apartment buildings. It's very hard to look back at the residential market now. I love the financing structure of apartment buildings, 100% easier, especially as business owners. It's so much easier. I love the scale of it. I love that it allows me to have enough of a scale to get third-party property management. However, the moment we hired our property management, it just, the performance wasn't there. Units weren't getting tenanted on time. Renovations were too expensive. There's just a number of factors that were just not allowing us to perform as well as we could. So my business partner started his own property management company because we just he just pivoted. He's like, we, we, we need to ensure performance here. We have investors uh, in these portfolios and it's his company. I'm not part of it, but it's made all the difference in how well our portfolio is performing. The fact that it's, he's in there day to day managing it, handling turnovers, you know, making sure everything is getting tenanted and done, maintenance and such. And that's really the benefit that I see in it. It's I, I don't I can't imagine owning a large portfolio and not having the control of the property management piece. Now I don't think property management is there for a lot of money. I think it that's what it's that's what its purpose is. It's to control the performance of your assets, where hopefully that's where you're gonna make the real money is you know, by owning those assets or having a piece of it. And two is having control of the funds and having mm. access to it where it flows through your accounts. I think that's really what the purpose of it is for, from what I've learned or from my perspective. Um, and then really it's there to do that. So it's okay that all the managers, your managers have most of the money because it's, it's your focus to go buy more real estate and all that piece of the pie. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I think you nailed it on the head. And it, it seems fortunate that you have uh, a partner who is able to fill that role. When you say partner, I'm assuming that they're also partnered in the properties, right? They are. So yes, that's, yeah. he is my business partner on all most of my apartment buildings. Okay. So yeah, that makes a huge difference. You know, one of the things that I feel a lot of real estate investors find is that good property managers at a certain point, they they stop taking on other clients. They stop growing because at some point it's just not worth it. And then it's and then it becomes difficult to find good ones because all the good ones stop taking on new people. And then all the ones who are now bringing on new people, they're they're new and experienced. And by the time they get good enough, they're gonna also stop taking people. Right. So it's not it it's very difficult to find that. That's why there's so many self-managing landlords. And you know, since you did pivot into the into the more standardized commercial residential sector, those properties are definitely going to be easier to manage. The only thing I, I find very troublesome about them is if you pick up a property that ends up developing some kind of pest issues. I find pest issues in those bigger buildings very <laughs> troubling to deal with because it has very little to do, I think, with the management as much as it has that sometimes certain buildings when they're a certain size just become very difficult. <laughs> and we partnered up with with a pest control company and we account for 30% of their business so they take good care of us. But we find that even with them, there there's just all these little problems. And that's what I'm saying. Even the fact that we're talking about this, it's like, this is not technically, I feel like what real estate investors ought to be talking about. But these little things just end up drawing you in and you're just like, what am I doing? And this is where, you know, as a business person, you need to take a step back, hire people to solve these problems and then focus on what you ought to be. Right? Yeah. So, so let's talk about that. You have done a bunch of different things in real estate. You've been involved in a few different businesses where is the cash flow at? You mean where is it coming from? 
Where do you think that real estate investors or business owners should be focusing on and where, where are you making most of your money? Okay. So that's a great question. So if this is for the purpose of advising other people, right? I think I, I want to preface it first by saying you have to look at what your strengths are. Even when, when at the career event, I said, you know, lean into your own advantages, right? I find people end up becoming very unhappy when they start to do things just because the money's there, but they're not so inclined. And then you end up doing a bad job of it anyway. So in terms of where I think the money is, I think it's right now it's tipping on a natural scale of the economy where houses are becoming, houses have become unattainable. Even though prices are dropping, it's still very expensive for people to buy. Purchasing power is low. We know that. So transactions and wholesale, wholesalers and realtors are having a hard time right now. Uh, mortgage people are having hard times right now because mortgage transactions are declining. So there's not a lot of money in that. But what is it, the only thing that we see climbing? Well, tenancies, rents, rents are climbing like crazy. There's a lot of initiative to increase rental units. So provisions for rental units, you can now have a single family home, you can add three units comfortably, you can stretch them to four. There's that, that's, that's starting to increase. We're seeing that happen and the government wants that. And in terms of and when, when that happens, that means that tenancies are going to turn over as well. And also we've had peak amount of evictions starting to happen now. It's like the landlord and tenant board has been catching up. So we have seen an increase in tenant placement. So realtors can consider doing tenant placement for landlords because that charges one month's rent. So, you know, if you're renting on a place for $2,000, $3,000, a realtor can make that by finding a tenant. There, and if you can continue to do that, that's a good revenue stream. Doing working on permits. Any anybody who's in the trades who understands how to do permits, if you can work with put together a team to do permits to add units to your property, basement units, ADUs through a garage or the backyard or anything like that, that will constitute as business. You can make money there. And then obviously, if you're if you're doing any anything with anything within that, I think other things that will be making money right now is still. If you can do renovation jobs, renovations across the board, it seems to me like it is generally expensive. It's like, even though we're bringing in a lot of people, I think Canada's trying to bring in people who will do this type of work, but it doesn't seem like it's getting any easier. We we have job postings for people and it's really hard to find people to do, to do any kind of renovations. It's like the population just doesn't seem like they're geared for it very well. So in terms of where the money is like that, that is these are some things that I'm seeing in Canada and, and what we're doing. But unfortunately, where the real opportunity is, is people are starting to invest in the U.S. <laughs> so Canadian opportunity is in the U.S. <laughs> so this is everybody's doing everybody's doing everybody's trying to like syndicate, group up, put money together, go and buy a cash flowing property in the U.S. You cannot cash flow. In Canada. So when you say, where's the money? Where's the cash flow? If you are a veteran real estate investor, you have opportunity. And that's this is good and bad because this is where the divide ends up happening. If you're a seasoned, you can just run with this. If you are trying to get on the side and you haven't already, now it's feeling like, well, maybe I should go somewhere else entirely. And that's what's happening. Right. So Canadians right now are pulling money. We're looking at Texas and other places, Tennessee, and 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 figuring out how to put money there. And we're not doing that because you know there's no money to be made here. It's just it shouldn't be as hard as it is today, right? And I see some people making money. They start doing very creative things. But do you really want to have to be so creative? You shouldn't have to be so creative as a front line to generate income. When you creativity should be a last ditch solution to solve problems not a first line of offense to make money. Does that answer the question? I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I very much agree with that, especially the last part of that conversation about the US. It's unfortunate, but it's true. When I pivoted from smaller residential to multifamily was because it was feeling really hard. You know, we had grown to 20 units, but it took us four and a half years. We were burning everything like with the construction company, they did well for us. They changed our, you know, financial trajectory, but then it became very hard. Nothing was making sense. Prices were high up there. Tenants issues were just at the top of its peak. And I thought that it shouldn't feel this hard. How do I scale further? I can't, I'm tapped out at 20 units. I don't want to stop here. And that's when I'm like, I need to pivot. And the pivot came, you know, in the form of the multifamily, the bigger stuff. 
which did great again for another two and a half years for us. We scaled quite fast. We had a lot of opportunity. The market was favorable, starting to feel hard again. And CMHC, I don't know if you how closely you follow, but we use on the commercial space, we use CMHC really heavily. When they came out with the MLI Select was honestly a really good product. It came out, we're like, yes, we can use this. We started leveraging it. Now they changed it again and made it just not favorable anymore. Unfortunately, with their new rules for the business model we had in, now it once again becomes, it feels difficult. It feels like nothing is looking good. We're putting offers out there, but sellers want way more, you know, than than really what what would be worth for us to buy. And yeah. it, it, we are, you know, it's, 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 it's work when you're burning something out. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of, there's construction, there's management. There's a lot that goes into it. You don't want to buy something for, you know, maybe one day, 10 years on the road will be good. You want to buy something that's going to be, you know, good enough for today and the potential for growth in the next 10 years. So this is where the U S came into question for me. Yeah. That's yeah, that's very interesting. By the way, the CMHC thing, it does seem like they're angling to encourage people in development more because right now the the CMHC has shifted, unless anything has changed, but you can tell me if it has. The CMHC has shifted to encouraging people to build rental, purpose built rental properties, right? So they're trying to build more accommodations, more rental units so that they can help to control things. But even that's still got a long way behind. But if you are looking to build purpose built rental properties, the CMHC program is amazing if you want so, to so that's so that's sort of so we are we're developing right now we're in the process of application for a 60 plus apartment building and this is all out in new brunswick because lend is affordable there costs are much lower so yes they what they've done is they've said stop renovating old buildings start building and that's really what is pushing people towards, which is fine. Development is a whole different business model, though. Okay. You know, it's a two-year out process. You're putting a lot of money in, not seeing anything back for a couple of years. You've got to have big pockets to the development or, you know, the right partnerships to have big pockets because that's what it takes. There's also a risk level to it that I didn't experience with existing buildings. I know what I'm buying. I know what I can rent it for. I know what the formula is here. I we knew right away what we were going to get on appraisal at the end of the day, just based on the power formula. So with 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 development, we don't fully know. We're, we're looking at a piece of land. Uh, we've been in the process for about a year and a half now. I feel like we're getting closer to it now, but it's every conversation we have is, what can we do here? Can we do this? What if that comes up? And and then the first time we submitted the application to the city, the community came back and was a hard no. And we mm. had to backtrack and go back to the drawing board and start all over again with a different plan. So that's that's development. And a year and a half in, we still don't know if it's going to get approved or not for sure. We have good inklings. I mean, we're, we're coming off of our educated guess as much as we can, but we just don't know for sure. So it's interesting. I think that if you are, if you can get there, cost of construction is still quite high. We've not we've run numbers over and over again, and it's still complicated. We it may work, it may not work. So even though CMHC gives you can give you up to ninety five percent loan to value, which is amazing, can you pull enough out at the end of the day once you're done to pay your investors back? That's a question mark because of construction costs. So again, yeah, it no. feels a little harder than it should. By the way, I, that, that makes me want to ask you a question. How involved are you in the development side of things? Because it, like, because you've done so many things now and you, you've had your hands in, in quite a few areas of real estate business. How, how, involved do, how involved did you did you get or are you just largely partnering with other people when it comes to the development aspect? Like how, where, do you, where does your involvement start and end? I'm pretty involved. I found the land that we purchased I meet I, I mean every meeting with the architects and the engineers and the design company and the construction company. Uh, I did bring in a partner because this was this is my first development. And I really you talked about partnerships earlier. I'm on the same of the same mind. I did bring a partner in that had experiences bringing things to site plan approval. Um, and I'm very happy I did. He's an engineer and he comes into those calls and he's able to talk 
you know, land levels and, mm. you know, things that I, my mind doesn't go there at all. Largely on my portfolio, I do have a lot of experience with construction and management and rentals and everything, but largely I'm a, a capital raiser. That's what I do on my end. I bring in all the funding for all of our deals, but I'm really heavily involved in management because I can add value and I like to know what's going on. I want to have be able to have a say on how well our all of our projects are performing, problem solve, you know, adjust, adapt, and give uh, some some thoughts and insight on what I can bring to the table. So I'm quite involved. It is my first one, so we're going to be learning from this. Mm. If it's going well, if it goes well, then we're definitely interested in doing more. Yeah. Okay, that, that sounds very interesting because, you know what, for a while there, we, Ping, Ping and I, we were looking into development opportunities and in terms of what we found feasible, well, it's such a it's such a precarious hill to climb where, first of all, we found that a lot of the deals we were sourcing, they weren't as advertised. We found tons of that. We're shocked at how much was out there being sold and they say, yeah, this is already, this is already, you do your due diligence, waste your time just to find out that this is not ready. And then when you go back to them and say, Hey, what the hell? They're just like, Oh, sorry. That's it. They don't correct their ad either. <laughs> they leave it for the next guy to go waste their time. So, you know, it seems like there, there's a lot of that. And there's a lot of people who are looking for the opportunity, especially in the storage space. So we were looking for things for storage for quite a while. And it does seem like it is very long-term money, right? So it's a long play. And you still end up having to, so it feels to me more like a money game where you need to find somebody who's going to find the opportunity and then you park money. And this is where there's, I think, a lot of people from East who are investing into these things is because these are long plays and they're often content with it. But it's definitely not, I think the problem people are facing today has largely to do with the cash flow today. And even though some people have some long plays in motion, it doesn't necessarily help them stay afloat with the bread and butter today. Okay, so people have problems with their own mortgages, variables on rental properties, even when renewals come up on commercial, right? If you're with anyone like Home Trust on a multi-res, people are finding themselves quite pinched. And the turnover of tenancies can be quite challenging with those units. So people, people, people need some versatility and development. I feel like it's a very shiny object when it comes to programs you can take advantage of. But definitely real people in real estate right now are in need to figure out how to address money today like now <laughs> and it's that that's a complicated one yeah exactly i find that specifically with developments there are shorter term strategies of flipping paper and such but even those mm. i think the risk level of development in general you gotta know really well what you're doing and have proof of concept to know that you can actually flip that paper and get to where you need to get with it but who's buying <laughs> construction costs are still quite high. It's still challenging to get funds, even to raise capital to, you know, put it towards a development project like that and build. So it's it's definitely challenging. I have a friend who's finished like site plan approval, large apartment building development. It's done. It's ready to go. They did what they had to do. They brought the value where they thought is the value should be, but now they can't sell. Mm. How long is it going to be on the market for? Who's buying, you know, a site plan approved, approved land to build a 60 unit apartment building? <laughs> Not a lot yeah. of people build that kind of building. So in our case, our strategy is to go all the way to build, especially because we're, this is in New Brunswick. It doesn't uh, value as much as it does in Ontario. Same thing, even smaller market, how many people are actually buying something like that to build? So our strategy from the beginning was always to bring it all the way to build, especially because we are in a permanent building space that goes along. It's aligned with our goals and vision to, you know, own and operate apartment buildings. Uh, we already have a team out there and everything, but it's, it's, it, I will keep you everybody posted, but I'm not quite there yet. We're still in the process of how this is going to turn out. It's exciting. And we see the light at the end of the tunnel we see, but it's, is it a strategy that you get in to make cash flow today? It, I wouldn't say it is. It's a long-term oh, yeah. play that will pay off one day, you know? <laughs> yeah. To be honest, actually, that is what house flipping is to us. It's sometimes people treat it as, as oh, this is the business. This is a large sum of money that you can make from uh, flipping a house. But for us, eventually, house flipping became a revenue stream. Every three to six or eight months, you can turn properties and you can get money out, right? And then you put it back in, you, you, you recoup some profits, and you're able to use it. And so that's where I feel 
people when when people are talking about how can they be versatile today and how can they solve the cost problems while real estate is while real estate investing is having certain challenges today i think people ought to focus on real estate business people who retired off of their portfolios and were landlords you can do property management right if if you if you want to and this it's i think it's weird to tell people hey go get a job but don't think about it like go get a job. Think about it like go and build a business, right? Because if you become a property manager, you can build a real estate business and this is your catalyst to scale. And I feel like, you know. 100%. That's been my greatest learning in real estate is here's what I learned. <laughs> I think where we've made big, big money has been in liquidating assets that we've owned for a while. So, and this is where the long-term game in real estate is, is that equity that you're going to eventually be able to tap into. You know, I don't know how quick, it was pretty quick on our end, but that's because we we caught it on the way up. We can't always time it like that, right? But we already know projection-wise in the next five to 10 years, we're going to be getting a lot of refinances or exits coming through from the buildings we purchased three, four years ago. Um, and that's where we've been able to get large injections of cash and just like life changing type of money that comes in. But uh, on the day to day basis, where we get our cash flow from is our businesses. There's no other way. It's that active. Yeah. We have the construction business. We have the virtual agency. We have uh, have an asset management company. And that's really what keeps the bill paying the bills. It's not the cash flow from our, our buildings. They don't make enough to to support us. Uh, especially because we're leveraged as much as we can on them. We keep refinancing so we can buy more. If you're if you're leveraged at 95% loan to value, you're not going to be cash flowing. If you're yeah. leveraged even at 80% loan to value, you're not going to be cash flowing nicely. So unless you have a portfolio of homes that you've paid off, then you're talking about like living off of cash flow. Anything other than that, you're really just re-leveraging your real estate to get more real estate and you're you're playing a long-term game here so then yeah. focus on businesses go get an active business you know focus on growing that and that's what's going to provide you the income now yeah while you're waiting for your long-term play of real estate to come back yeah by the way adrian you're one of the you're you're one of the few people that i've actually not, have now spoken to who has that versatility because a lot of people that you'll talk to who are in real estate they're real estate investors um they're often they're there's a big difference between real estate investors and real estate business people, right? Re investing, the way I view it, is an aspect of real estate business. It ought to be like a department, right? Where you have an acquisitions department and you buy property as part of it. Because for us, it also the rent rolls, it's not meant, if, if it makes any money, it's considered a bonus, right? But it's otherwise, the goal is like, just make sure it has reserves, it's building some reserves and it breaks even. And, and when when problems happen, we don't have to tap into our acquisition equity. And we're able to use the, the reserves to pay for the, the property itself, and it will make money over time. And then you're hedging, but it, it can't be the primary avenue. Because if you have real estate business, the nice thing about it is that at least you have versatility of options, business people can decide to become profitable, should they just decide to and you can make more money whether it's leaning down your staff you know hopefully you don't have to do that but when usually in an expansion you might over expand and then you can at least reel it back should you need to you can consolidate roles you can diversify people and this is where i think if if real estate people get into some kind of synergistic business synergy is important because the minute you can cross platforms like accounting is is synergistic across any business that you have, right? Bookkeeping, you're going to need someone like that. And if they can handle multiple businesses, amazing. Now, if you also, the reason why I talk about renovations a lot, yes, I have a background in it, but also because I think anybody who's a contractor listening, anybody who's a renovator, any anybody who has, who's in, who has is a power couple and they, and somebody's doing the renovations in that power couple, you can really make money today and if and you can and there's no reason why anybody in the trades doesn't have their own properties to work on if you have if you have off time go work on your own property and make something better build an apartment unit right do something there's always something to do and that's i think the easiest way because there's a lot of guys especially they like to do this stuff just for fun they have tools that they use as hobbies and those tools can make you bank so i mean and and then from there you just need to figure out how to not do everything yourself. Most of the trades that I that I talk to, the biggest problem they have is everything that they do is just like, well, no one can do it better than me, so I'm going to do it myself. And that is your choke point. But 
you can learn how to address that later. <laughs> So, oh my gosh, you're speaking my language here, because in my transition from starting real estate, understanding, you know, what I needed to adapt here, which was building businesses, I ran into a problem immediately. I'm like, I've never done, I've never built a business before. How do I go about doing that? I know I need to build systems, processes, team members, but I have no idea how. And the virtual agency is my answer to that because I quickly realized I started hiring. I'm like, not good at this. Hired somebody, didn't work out, hire somebody else, hire somebody that I liked. But then I get on the call. I'm like, okay, so not what, <laughs> how are you going to help me? They're like, oh, I don't know. Tell me what to do. I, I don't know what you like, you know, it was just such a, an interesting process to go through. And I realized a lot of small business owners or solopreneurs, a lot of us will start as solopreneurs. We're doing everything ourselves. And we don't know that it's not a skill that we've learned yet, how to hire and how to train somebody, how to pass off tasks, how to systemize and make a process repeatable so somebody can take over from you. Uh, and this was kind of my answer with a virtual agency. We work with North American VA. So uh, as much as overseas, you know, can be more affordable, it comes with a bunch of issues, unfortunately, with language barriers, as well as, you know, just, just people's experience level. You wanted somebody that's going to come into your business and actually make a huge difference and take things off of your head and not give you more work where you have to <laughs> micromanage them. You know? yeah. Classic. Yeah. <laughs> so, and this is what we, we focused on. We also do fractional services. And to your point, you talked about bookkeeping and accounting. I, I realized what are the areas of businesses that every business needs help in finance is a big one. Bookkeeping is our most on-demand service at the agency. Uh, we do bookkeeping and fractional CFO services for businesses uh, we do marketing and sales because every business needs leads. We do HR, uh, HR. So we come into your company, we find out who do you need on your team that we can go find for you and then support them in assisting you in your business. And that's all fractional. So you don't have to go out and get somebody full time if you don't have the scale or the budget to do so. You can go and get somebody for eight hours a week and 10 hours a week that's qualified and can come in and make a big difference within that time. And then we do like uh, CRM build outs because that's the other thing. You've got to start building those processes and systems. That's what that VA is going to help you do. And in order to do that, you need that back end. You need your CRM build out. You need processes and systems and SOPs. And so that's really the four areas of businesses that we help people with. Mm -hmm. And that was my answer to like, how do I help myself build my business? How do I help, you know? My husband is the one that leads the construction company. How do I help him build his business? Because he's out there on the trades, not anymore, but he used to be. That was all his knowledge and skill set was being outside on the trades. Now he's learning to be a business owner and actually take it from a different perspective. So, yes. Yeah. By the way, that's <laughs> we're we're gonna end up going on, but yeah, like the 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 thing. Just just to contextualize something, I feel like is important here is the cross utilization of your infrastructure is extremely important and i think people ought to really consider what infrastructure is infrastructure is your systems it is your network it is the people that you have doing work with you and by the way your model just just to make sure i understand correctly that model works on that you have people and you make a margin on their hourly or whatever it is right okay so yeah that that counts as a cash flow by the way, our property management, it pays the bills. It pays the day-to-day. -day. And that is where people, I think, sometimes end up suffering, real estate investors end up suffering, is they don't have anything to pay the day-to-day. -day. It was the investing that was paying the day-to-day, -day, but the investing should be localized. So if you have something where you can cross-utilize some of your infrastructure into something else, for example, if you hire a maintenance guy to do renovation jobs, and you also have that maintenance guy go do work on your properties, easy cross utilization. If you have somebody who's going to be doing bookkeeping, let's say you have a restaurant, you also get them to do the bookkeeping for your rental property. You also get them to do the bookkeeping in your next venture. Amazing synerg amazing synergizing that you're doing there. And if you put these things into motion, because people don't, I think real estate investors don't like to talk sometimes about the small money. If it seems like small money, they're just like, oh, well, like, you know, is it really worth it? But if you undervalue micro optimizations, in your business across the board. 2% here, 2% there, 2% everywhere adds up really quickly. And like we do something, I'm not, I don't want to talk about this too much, but we 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 did something that seems petty, but it adds up. 
we buy maintenance materials on large scale. Basically, whenever something goes out of fashion or out of goes on super sale from a big box store like IKEA, Home Depot, anything, they just have something on an insane clearance. Like we bought Moen faucets for forty dollars a piece. I don't know why they were selling them at that price. Like I have no idea. I don't even. I, I'm not even trying to figure it out. But we bought them all. We we won't use them all, but we will use them through our maintenance, through our property management. But we also have our administrator selling off some of them, and we do about thirty percent on that stuff as well. That adds up, right? It's just uh, it, it's it's you do a little bit here, and as long as it's not costing you anything, because the minute you have infrastructure, your cost becomes very low. Right. This is why contractors, if you are competing in the small to mid-sized house flipping area, it's very difficult to compete with contractors because you cannot compete with their costs down. Right. So micro optimizations, I think, are key. Listen, 100 percent. This is where places like Walmart, Home Depot, they get their advantage from because they can literally like I'll buy anybody in terms of their cost saving. You know, any business, there's a simple math here is cost and revenue. Like, what is, what are your costs? How can you optimize that? Part of what we do when we do CRM build outs and process systems, that's exactly what we do. We minimize human resource cost because now we have a repeatable system. We automate everything. I'm a, a queen of automations. We have so much technology and AI nowadays. Nobody should be doing as much manual work as this is a breakthrough in history, really, that we can automate things and leverage AI to get a lot of things done as much as we can. That's just, how do I make any process about three steps long? That's the challenge I give myself and the team. Let's push this. Let's push. Let's make it as, as quick as we can, as automated as we can, but yet with as much value and accuracy as we can offer as well, that minimizes your 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 human hours because now you one person can run five, six, seven processes for you in a matter of seconds. It's just so, mm -hmm. so exciting to see it happen. The leverage that we get from AI and technology is just massive. And we want to continue to build out that way. Yeah. You know, you're... <laughs> This is, this is I I love it when you talk when I when I speak to anybody who's in who's in business because this is this is actually where there's so much advantage because there there comes people sometimes don't notice when they've built a business around the people versus finding the people to fit into their business model and then you end up becoming hostage to the people that work for you because you if you lose them you there's no SOP there's only what everything is in their head and this is where you need to get them to write down their process. And if they're if they are overly intelligent, I find, as in they are next level smart, no one else is going to be able to follow their SOP. And that becomes a problem, right? So you 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 want to you want to at least aim towards, and this is why we didn't scale the property management. Honestly, I couldn't write SOPs good enough for this. I rely on people who can think critically in certain situations because uh, the SOPs become too too detailed and then no one reads them. So the you should aim, I think, to be able to have an SOP where if somebody leaves, you can replace them relatively easily. And you can do that in trades because uh, a lot of it is like there's certain basic skills that things are measurable. Anything that is a little bit more standardized, you can do this. So if you want to get into something standard businesses are great however the competition i think is pretty can be pretty steep with that if there's if it's not so standardized and it's a little more gray you probably need to apply more thought but there's a little more money to be made there a little more opportunity but if it doesn't matter what it is everybody has an advantage something that you do probably touches on real estate somehow if you just lean into it, I think you can build something. So true. I love that. We This has been a great conversation. I don't think I've gone over time in a long time. So I'm going to end with a question. Oh, shit. If, yeah. you had, if you had the world's attention for 30 seconds, what would be the message you would put out there? Okay. These things, I feel they always sound cheesy, but ultimately... Always act in passion when when you can. Try not to act in fear. Don't make decisions based on fear. The world tends to lean a certain way and opportunity lies in, in areas where you find yourself going against the grain. So when the world is fearful, try to act in passion. And when the when when the world is saying one thing, don't forget to don't and the attention is one way, don't forget to look to the side and see what see what you'd be missing because opportunity often lays in the gray 
and by the time everybody's talking about it it's not there and i think this is this will this will be fruitful in many areas of your life i think i love that thank you so much andrew it's been a pleasure having you on where can people find you Honestly, Instagram is the easiest place right now. Just andrew.parashis. You know, I, I'm really easy to find. Otherwise, just type into Google or YouTube, uh, Property Hustlers. We put out video and content all the time where we talk about what it means to be a real estate investor, what it means to be an everyday landlord, and how to solve uh, those type of problems and do what you need to do. Thank you. I'm sure I'll be seeing you again very soon. Best of success with everything. Thanks for being a guest on the Adriana Ostapenko podcast. Thank you very much for having me.